Well, <laughs> I think it's a brand new year. Amen. I know uh, so many of you have already made plans. You've got your calendars out. You've written down goals. You're trying to get your mind and your goals on the same page. You're excited about what's forthcoming, and uh, I'm excited about what's forthcoming as well. Let me encourage you to do something. Take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to the book of Haggai, uh, about four back from the New Testament. And there's only a couple of pages, so be careful because you will pass it. A very small book, only two chapters, and we're just going to be here for about three weeks. And all across the landscape of the United States, you're going to see this brand new year having sermon titled the 2020 vision and that's exactly where we're going to go this year we're going to look we're going to start with a a, a vision but we're going to do it from a, a biblical perspective we're going to try and see what god's desire for us is and, and we're going to use some uh, of israel's examples to try and figure out what it is god desires for us to do at first baptist church henderson tennessee this next year and and at this point moving forward you know, we, it's, it's always for us where we're wanting to serve the Lord. We want to glorify the Lord in the way we're living our lives as Christ followers. But, but there's always something else for us to do. There's always something more that we can be a part of when it comes to kingdom growth. And that has to be our mindset. Well, that was exactly the mindset of Haggai, especially when it comes to, to rebuilding the temple of God. And, and so as we look at this scripture this morning, I, I pray that God would use it um, to get you excited about what God can do First Baptist Church this year, uh, about remodeling, about rebuilding, but also something that you really have to comprehend. You need to understand this, is, is does God want to do something new in your life this year? You know what I think? I think the answer is yes. I think beyond a shadow of a doubt, God's desire is that you would allow him to do something brand new in your life this year. And the only way that's going to happen, it's not going to happen by accident. How many of you understand? Say amen or oh me. Yeah. It's not going to happen by accident. God is not going to do something spectacular in your life by accident. He's not going to do something spectacular in the life of First Baptist Church by accident. It has to be planned, it has to be organized, it has to be thought out, and then we have to put our hands and feet to the fire and get busy working for King Jesus. So I'm excited about this new year. I mean, there's all kind of stages in life, right? And so for many of us, we think you know, we're raising our children, we get them through school, they start college, they have great expectations of their very own, they think they know what they want to do, yet when they get into college, they have five or six different majors before they finally get graduated into something that they don't even spend the rest of their lives pursuing. I was one of those individuals as well. It's a fact. I changed my, uh, my major several times before I, I finally got focused in on, on what I felt like I, I wanted to learn or, or to pursue. And then, and then God calling me into ministry and placing me where he wanted me. And then everything really began to change because what, what God wanted for me and what I wanted for, for myself, they really weren't lining up. They weren't parallel. They weren't tracks that a train runs on. And you and I both know what happens, reality is, when we're trying to, to be that track that goes side by side with King Jesus and, and ours turns a different direction, then the train derails and it causes a great mess. And so we're going to look at this section of scripture today. And, and my prayer is that God would just bless. That's my hope. It's my desire is that you'd pay attention to the scripture more than you do me. And then you'll listen to the heart of God uh, as we enter into this brand new year. And so let me encourage you this morning, if you would honor God by standing at the reading of his word. Haggai chapter 1, I'm going to read uh, all the way through verse 8. I'm going to try to pronounce some names that I don't know how to pronounce. And so uh, when we get to those names and I'm stuttering through them, just go with it, okay? All right, let's, let's read. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, 
and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts. Now listen to this. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into bags with holes. Now, just pause for just a moment. How many of you does that sound very familiar to? Yeah, let's go on seven and eight. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways, go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it, that I may be glorified, says the Lord. Will you pray with me? Father, Help us to, to have a brand new vision in this brand new, this new decade. Father, f fill our minds with, and our hearts with the dreams that you desire us to dream. Lord, lead us, yes, in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Lord, as we make our own plans, I pray that that you would make sure that our hearts are so in tune with yours that our plans and your plans are the same. Oh, Lord, what we could get accomplished if we would just move in accordance with how you are moving. Lord, be with our time this morning as we study your word. Help us to learn what you would have us to learn today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me, let me kind of give you the, the mood of Haggai. I mean, really, the word of the Lord came to Haggai about the fourth year of initially uh, Solomon's reign. He had been reigning now for a, a few years. The temple had been built. Then, then there comes a time in, in 587 where Nebuchadnezzar, he comes and, and he destroys the temple. He ransacks Jerusalem. And everything falls apart. And so the southern kingdom of Judah is completely destroyed along with the temple. And, and everything is literally left in ruin. This is what Satan does when, when we give him a, a foothold. I mean, he comes in and, and he really tries to destroy the work that God is is trying to do. And, and so you have to be aware of that because it's not something that he just does in the churches. His, his real goal is to destroy you and your families. I mean, that's that's what he wants to do. He, he wants to cause you to compromise. He wants to cause you to give in. He wants to cause you to give up. And you know the reality for so many of us Christ followers is that's exactly what we do. Can, can we be real for a moment? You, you know, for so many of us, we don't have a lot of fight in us when it comes to spiritual battles. And so as we think about this in 587 BC that Nebuchadnezzar sends his, his troops in to destroy Jerusalem, then there's a, a, a split, the, the temple is destroyed, the, the Jews were taken into captivity and, and that's where they were some, really for about 70 years but maybe somewhere between 16 to 20 years before that some of those who had been taken into captivity had been released. You can turn back, you can study the book of Nehemiah, you know, they, they leave, um, they go and they rebuild the walls around Jerusalem, and, and they're really doing some good things. I mean, they're excited, they really believe that this is what God had, had allowed them to do, God was protecting them, then they started having all of these outside forces come against them, and then they started having inside forces work against the building of the walls, the building of the temple, and it stopped. For about 16 years, nothing was being done at all on the temple. 
somewhere around 538 B.C., maybe a little bit later than that. It's amazing how God always has someone who will step up and prophesy that if they don't get back to work, then they're going to continue to wander in the wilderness. Let me ask you a question. Be real with yourselves. How many of you feel like you've just been wandering in the wilderness? Just, just be real. Any of you at all feel like you've just been wandering? Just, just a few of you? And I think if, I, I know that's calling you out. I, I know it's, it's not a good thing to do. We don't want to raise our hand to that, but, but for so many of us, that's just reality. And so that's the reason being obedient to, to God and his call and his word is so important. And so God raised up Haggai to call the people back to the task that he had prepared them for, which at that time was to rebuild the temple. And we're going to move on. We're going to talk about some very specific things concerning you as well. But listen to what the scripture says in, in verse 2. So, so we know what year it was. Darius the king was in, in charge. It was a Six months on the first day, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet of Zerubbabel, uh, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of uh, Jehozadak, the high priest. Listen to verse 2. This is, this is really, really good. Listen. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say that the time has not yet come to rebuild the house. Of the Lord. Let's camp there for just a moment. I want you to hear this because but this is what God said. He said, These people. He didn't say, My people. He said, These people. Do you know why He said, These people? Because the people had decided they were going to do things their own way rather than God's way. That's how it happens so many times in our lives. We decide that we're going to do things our way. We want God to do big things, but we have our plans. We have our ideas. And then when we interject that with God through prayer, God is like, wait a minute. That's not my plan. And we just continue to circle. And we circle. And we circle, never getting anything significant accomplished because we're doing it our way rather than God's way. What would happen? What would happen if we would get to a point where the Almighty Lord says we're no longer these people, but we're his people? How would that bless you? How would how would that the spirit move in your heart? Because this he went on and he said this. These people, says the Lord, says the time has not yet come to rebuild my house, my temple. Really, you, you get the big picture of this because if you're a parent and you've raised your children and you tell them to do something, your expectation is that that's exactly what they're going to go do. How often does that really work? How often we're, we're having this conversation with our children and we're, we're, we have big plans, big dreams, big hopes, big aspirations. We have all of these things for our children and we're discussing these things or we just simply say, I need you to go do this. And they look at us like we've absolutely lost our mind and we've grown a, grown a second head. <laughs> Parents, be real. How many of you have had your children look at you like you've grown a second head? Yeah, I see some of your second heads right now. It's kind of scary looking. So I understand when your children, when they see that second growth on the shoulder right here, and you know, you're all cockeyed, it's kind of spooky a little bit. But does that second head make them get to whatever it is that you called them to do? Not usually. Usually they procrastinate even more, don't they? Or, or, or they'll do it, but they'll do it begrudgingly and that's not how God desires us to live our lives and so these people say the time has not yet come to build the Lord's house but that's not what God said so the, the closer we get to doing what God wants then you have to understand
understand something. The closer we get to doing what God wants, the more opposition you're going to face. This is real. I want you to be obedient to the Lord. I, I want you to live for his honor and his glory. But you have to know there are going to be consequences whether you obey God or whether you don't. And if you obey God, you're going to receive the blessings of God. But hell is literally going to storm your home. We don't like that battle. We don't like that fight. We don't like that front. And so we generally back away. I, I, I don't have to do that right now. And then the dreams, the hopes, the aspirations that we've been looking into for so long, they literally fall to the wayside. How many of you have had dream after dream after dream, and you really believe that God had laid those on your heart that had just been laid to the side time after time after time because of that opposition? Raise your hand. It's real, isn't it? It's difficult. It's not, it's not fun. And so what I want you to understand is that you don't need to worry when you face those opposition. What does worry get you? It, it causes you to have a stroke and your face to go numb. It's what happens. It causes you to have so many other kind of physical ailments. And some of you are experiencing those type situations right now. And I'm not telling you, you turn to the Lord, you, you repent, you, you trust him, you walk in accordance to his ways and all of that's going to go away. I'm not telling you that at all. But I am telling you that even on this side of heaven, when you obey God, your cup Will, your spiritual cup will overflow in ways that you cannot imagine. I mean, those, those hopes and those dreams and those plans, I have written things down over and over again because that's what all of the smart people do. That's what all of the intelligent people do. That, that's what, what smart people tell us to do, and I have worked through, beginning to work through steps. Okay, this is a dream. This is a hope. This is an aspiration. How am I going to get this accomplished? And then there are steps involved with every one of these. And then that discouragement hits. And I just throw my hands up in the air. I back away and I say, not yet. And because I procrastinate, I, I don't really experience the goodness that the Word of God promises. So th this is what I need you to get. You, sometimes you've got to choose the hard things, the difficult things, rather than the easy wrong things. Sometimes you, you've got to push through and you've got to push ahead simply because it's what God desires. In, even in the midst of the opposition and the heartache and the hard times that, that are completely surrounding you that particular moment. Or, or maybe even now. How many of you remember when you were personally in high school? I, it wasn't something I really enjoyed, but I did it. I remember I got to the end, and I graduated, and I got to walk across the stage, and I got to get that fake diploma. And I, I was just so excited, you know, because they don't give you the real one on the stage because most teenagers are losers. And then I went to college, and, and that same mentality, I mean, I didn't want to go to college. I didn't want to study. I didn't want to do any of it. But the benefit of me going and persevering and pushing through meant that at some point in the future, I was going to complete all the work that I had to get completed, and I was going to graduate. But you know what happened after just a few months in? This is my first go around. I I threw my hands up in the air, I backed away, and I said, yeah, college is just not for me. Anybody else? And it was the opposition. It was me having to buckle down and study and work hard. I wasn't wanting to do any of those things. And then God began to do a work in my life. When God began to do a work in my life, I had a new passion, I had a new vision, I had new dreams. I believed God wanted me to go back to school. I, at 25 years old, went back to school. It was hard. It was difficult. It was excruciating. 1 and 2 a.m., I, I didn't drink coffee at all until I turned 25, 26 years old. Now I, I drink it 
about a pot in the morning and half a pot in the afternoon and we get to go to Urban House a lot. I mean, those are just the things that we do because I'm caffeine dependent. Any, anybody else caffeine dependent now? Yeah. So, so here we are in 25 years old, 26, I'm taking an English class. I hated it because all we did was write. Terrible. I didn't do it. I did it, but I, I didn't like doing it. I turned all my work in, you know, and I passed. I had a B in English. I was surprised. I got excited. I mean, that was the first class I took. Why English? Why, why did I take something like PE? Or weight training 101 or, or, or uh, chef. I, why didn't I learn how to cook? Why didn't I do something that would have been fun? No, I had to go and take English. In my, in my mind, I wanted to get these hard classes out of the way, those things that I didn't enjoy. And so then the next semester came and I went back full time and I worked hard. One, two o'clock at night, writing papers, drinking coffee, waking up at literally four o'clock, going to FedEx, unloading boxes, and I did that for a while. And then God just opened doors. It's, it, I'm just, it's just pushing through the hard. You have to see there's some spiritual battles there as well, right? You have to push through the hard and the difficult because the easy is the way that so many of us take. But sometimes the blessing is in the easy, and so for so many of us, it's easy to keep our sin a secret, and it's hard confess and ask for help. It's easy to keep charging and, and buying for what we want with that credit card and it's, it's hard to deny ourselves and, and destroy that credit card. It's just the truth. It's easy to hold a grudge. It's hard to forgive. It's easy to follow the crowd and do what everyone else is doing. It's hard to be different and do things the right way. And so, how many of you is this really hitting home to you? You don't need to raise your hand. I, I mean, I'm going to move on, but I want you to think about these things because throughout your life, God's going to stir something up on the inside, and when he stirs those things up, his desire for you is that you be obedient in those moments and you step forward confidently pursuing him and his desires for your life. And when you do those things, oh, I think you'll see, what I think you'll understand is maybe the time is now. Is the time to be obedient to the Lord right now, or is it tomorrow? Now. The time to do what's right is, is now. And the time to do what's right, it might not be easy, but it's what's right because it's what God desires. And so the word of the Lord in, in verse 3 and 4 and 5, it says this. It says, in the word of the Lord came to Haggai through the prophet uh, Haggai again. It, it's time for you yourselves this is what the people were saying, to be living in your paneled houses while my house remains in ruins. Now this is what the Lord Almighty says, give careful thought to your ways. And so here's the idea that, that Haggai was trying to paint. This is what God was doing with Haggai so that he could relay that message to the people. You know, you're more concerned about your comfort than you are about what God's desires are. I mean, it, here's the big picture for today. What is it that you and I need to do to be the most kingdom effective in order to grow ourselves and in order to bring lost people into a relationship with King Jesus? How, how do we need to be different? Yes, you as individuals, but, but also us as a church because the ultimate goal is about winning souls for Christ. Amen. So if we're in agreement on that, then, then why is it that, that we're still doing the same old things that we've always done? We're living in our panel houses and our hopes and our, our aspirations are, are about making sure. So, all right, let me, let me back up for just a moment. When he says panel houses, it literally means that they were living in luxury. That's what it means. For Haggai, as, as God was sharing this vision, it literally meant you're preparing your own homes, your own futures 
and you're living in luxury while my home is in ruin. So, so you, you think on that for just a moment. Living in those panel houses, they were big, they were bright, they were high-end living. And, and, and listen to me, God's not against you having. It's not at all what I'm saying. It's not even what, what Scripture teaches. But you have to understand about being obedient to the Word of God uh, above all else. And that does mean that sometimes you and I have to make sacrifices in order to glorify the Lord with certain decisions along our way. So we've got to give careful thought to our ways. So in what area of your life are you not putting God first? You don't need to answer that for me. But you do need to answer that. You see, we, we have this belief that God is with us, that he'll never leave us nor forsake us, that he's always present. If we really believe that, then why is it that we make some of the decisions that we make? different life would be if we just completely surrendered and sold out to the things of God? How much different? Yeah, their opposition is going to come, but, but let, me, let me share this with you. You face opposition every single day. So if you know it's, it's about you being obedient to, to God's word, one thing you should understand is whatever you think the Lord has laid on your heart, it will never contradict the word of God. Amen? It's, it's always going to work out with what God has to say. And so, so many of us, we say, well, comfort over calling. My house over his house. Having more so that I can do more. Being consumed with self rather than with others. And making a name over making a difference. And that's just the mentality of today. And so I think it's important that you and I get to a point where we start our day with God. Yes? Oh, me? Amen? Yeah. I mean, I want you to get this. I don't want you to just say, say amen and just start your day with God and and then when you find yourself in those difficult situations throughout the day, you can remember, hey, I started my day with God. I'm going to end it with God. For so many of us, we might even start with God, but that didn't work. Then our mind shifts back to our old way of thinking. Listen to verse 6 and follow. You have sown much and you have harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, so you never get your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them in bags with holes. work our rear ends off, not get anything accomplished, not satisfied, we earn more and more money and, and still not satisfied. We, we, we never have any left over at the end of the month. It's always about acquiring more and accomplishing more, but we still feel empty here. And you don't need to raise your hand. You, you don't need to say, yes, preacher, that's me. I, I'm feeling empty right here. I can tell you, I know I'm not Dr. Phil. But this is how, how we are, so many of us. We just have this empty feeling simply because you and I are not doing what we know God desires us to do. It's plain and simple and to the point. So here's verse 7 and 8. And we'll wrap this thing up this morning. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Literally, you say, you need to pay close attention. I mean, you don't need to just have a thought that's passing, that's fleeting. You need to really pay attention. Consider every way that you have, every decision you make, every thought that runs into your mind. You need to consider all of your ways. 
Go up to the hill. This is now what he says do. Because in, in the process of considering our ways, we have this option. I can do what's coming next or I cannot do what's coming next. And so then he says, go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. All right, so here it is. Listen, go up to the mountain. See, in biblical terms, the mountain is always where God is present. The mountain is where God provides. Over and over again, biblically, this is where God shows up. And when God shows up, he always gives exactly what is needed for the moment that he's calling you to. Very specific. So go up to the mountain. And then he says, bring down the timber. Everything that you need is up on the mountain. You don't have to worry about trying to create it or build it or find it. Just go where I tell you to go. Do what I tell you to do and bring it down. And then he says this, build my house. Very specific, isn't it? See, here, here's the reality. You and I live in a society. And this is not just about First Baptist Church, but you and I live in a society today that would rather worship in luxury than we would rather worship on a dirt floor. It's, it's true. When in, in Indonesia and China and me, of the, these underground where they're not even allowed to worship in the Philippines, sometimes it's, it's very difficult. You'll see worshipers knee deep in water simply because they want to gather together and worship the Lord. I mean, it, it doesn't matter if it rains, if it snows, if it's coming a tsunami. They're going to do whatever they can do in order to get to the worship place, in order to lift their voices up in unison, sing praises, bowing down and humbling their hearts in the presence of the Lord, want to be obedient always. That's their goal. And our plan is only if we feel like it. Now, let's, let's get to First Baptist. Let's talk. How, how long have we lived and worshipped here? I can't remember the exact year. I think 2008 is when First Baptist moved into this building because God had given her a vision. God had given her a dream. And yes, hard and difficult seasons, opposition arising. And it did. And we've still procrastinated over the years and, and over the years and over the, and we procrastinated and we procrastinated. And, and still today, when you come in to First Baptist Church, we continue to worship in a gym. And, and, and that's okay. But you know God gave a vision to First Baptist Church to build. You know that. And I want to tell you, it's time for us to do something different. It's, it's not time for us to continue to live the old way. And, and, and now put this on a personal level. Now let's, let's think how many times if has God laid something on your heart and you know this is exactly what God wants you to do and you've begun to move forward yet opposition arises and then you take your hands off of the reins you remove them from the steering wheel you're not going to do it anymore and it's not that you're letting God control the situation or the narrative it's that you don't want to fight the opposition it, on a personal level listen we countless times personal life, in our family life, uh, over and over again. And so, so, so here's really, this is the takeaway of the day. I, how do you follow God's will? You ready? Step by step. One step at a time. Obedience today. We're obedient today. We wake up tomorrow and we've, we've got a little momentum. You know, it's really easy to, to move forward when you've got a little momentum. I'm talking about this new year for yourselves now. 
And so what you've got to do is you've got to make some hard rights over the easy wrongs. You've got to make some hard rights over the easy wrongs in order that God would get the glory in your life, in order that God would get the glory in our life. I want to call the worship team up. We're, we're going to wrap this thing up. We're finished. But let's, let's keep moving on a personal level because I, I think we've got to ask ourselves now, what is God is asking me to do? Specifically. Today, you, as this person, who look deep, look hard. It's, it's a new year, it's a new decade. You, I'm telling you, I know you've got hopes and dreams and aspirations and all those things, and it doesn't matter how old you are, it doesn't matter how young you are, if you, you feel like it's a way for you to honor God, then you've got to move forward with those plans. And those dreams and those hopes. You see, because that's where God's glorified. Yes, church, yes. So you, you consider your ways. 2020 is, is here. It's not something that you've got to wait on. It's, it's here. For some of you as, as Christ followers, you're already in a relationship with the Lord. Maybe you've, you've veered off slightly gotten off course a little bit. Maybe you're not managing your finances quite the way God desires for you to. Maybe you're not managing your, your relationship quite the way you need to. Maybe whatever it is, that area that you're in control of, that you're managing, what changes do you need to make, Christian? Now maybe it is that you're here today and you don't know Christ Jesus as your Savior. I want to tell you today, this will be the biggest decision that you ever made. I can tell you for a fact that it'll be the biggest decision that you make today is to invite Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. How many of you would today get to a point when, when you can decide, I, I, don't, I don't want to keep trying it my way. I'm, I'm ready to do it God's way. And, and just... Turn everything over to Him. This is God's desire for you. Yeah, we use this big word, repent, from your sin, but it, it literally just means to turn the other way. Stop trying to do things your way and start doing things God's way. First step is just humble your heart and say, Lord, I know I've messed up on so many levels. I've made a mess of my life. I just ask you to, to know that, that I'm acknowledging today that I, I'm, I'm a mess. See, this is where God wants you to be. To, to be able to acknowledge, yeah, you're a mess. And that God sent His Son, Jesus, to die on that old rugged cross to clean up your mess. To pay for your sin debt. Day, all you've got to do is say, I, I just want to believe on Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. But you, you, yes, mean it, but then you, you've got to start living it. It's not enough for you to just walk the aisle and say, this is what I want, and say a prayer. You've got to live it. Today, maybe that's you. So we're going to have an invitation. Christian, if God has spoken to you, you just need to come and you need to pray about this new year, 2020 vision, brand new. Make, make the hard rights instead of the easy wrong this year, brand new year. We're going to sing and you come this morning. Let's stand. When we walk with the Lord.